ever stop to think about what's happening like right into your feet in the garden? There's this whole hidden world. Oh, absolutely. It's buzzing with activity and it's uh, way more connected to how our plants grow than most people realize. Exactly. And that's what we want to dig into today, especially if you're looking to, you know, boost your garden naturally, maybe even make your own fertilizer. Right. So we're looking at a few interconnected things here. Yeah. Three main areas. Yeah. First up, what tree roots and their uh, fungal buddies get up to in the springtime. It's actually fascinating. Mm -hmm. Then we'll shift to the practical stuff, collecting these things called indigenous microorganisms or IMO, how you can actually gather them. And finally, we'll touch on some different viewpoints on collecting them because... Well, nature's rarely got just one script, has it? Definitely not. And for this, we've looked at um, a research paper, some classroom chats, and even just some on-the-ground observations. A good mix. So our mission today is pretty simple, really. We want to pull out the key bits from all that, link them together for you, and show how understanding the soil science stuff can genuinely help in your own backyard. Okay, let's dive in. Starting with those trees waking up in spring. So that research article, it was about beech and Scott's pine, right? And their fungi friends. That's the one. They were looking specifically at that moment when things warm up after winter. The big question was, basically, how do the sugars and starches stored in the tree roots affect what the fungi are doing, enzyme-wise? So it's like the tree's energy reserves kicking things off underground. Pretty much. And the main takeaway... The amount of sugar available in those roots is directly linked to how active the fungal enzymes get. Higher sugar, more activity. Interesting. And didn't it also mention something about the trees helping break down dead fungi? Yes. That was a really neat part. The trees indirectly play a role in decomposing the fungi that have died off. It's sort of a built-in recycling system. Okay, hang on. How does that work? There was mention of ketin and ketones. What are those, again, mm -hmm. simple terms? Right. So ketones is this tough material. It's what fungal cell walls are made of and insect shells, too. It doesn't break down easily. Okay. Tough stuff. And ketonase is the specific enzyme that can chop up ketin. So if you want to recycle the nutrients locked up in dead fungi, you need ketonase activity. Got it. But the trees don't make the ketonase themselves. Well, no, not directly. What happens is the trees leak stuff from their roots, sugars, organic acids, things like that. Food for the neighbors. Exactly. That feeds other microbes in the soil, like certain bacteria and even other types of fungi. And releasing those substances also kind of signals to these microbes, hey, time to ramp up enzyme production. And that includes making more ketonase. Ah, so the trees are like prompting the cleanup crew by offering snacks. That's a great way to put it. And the whole point, as Mr. Hendricks explained it, is nutrient cycling. Breaking down that dead fungal chitin releases valuable nutrients back into the soil. Nutrients that the tree can then use again. And the other microbes, too. Precisely. It benefits everyone involved. A really efficient loop. So Steen's take was pretty blunt, wasn't it? Trees help decompose the fungi they fed before just to get the nutrients back. Yeah, basically. Cut straight to the chase. It's a pragmatic relationship. Which does make you wonder, like Kesser was thinking, does this springtime root activity, this enzyme buzz, affect the best time to collect soil microbes? Like for IMO. That's a really sharp question. It strongly suggests that, yeah, the soil's microbial community isn't static. It probably ebbs and flows with these seasonal cycles driven by the trees. Okay, so that leads us perfectly into actually collecting these microbes, these indigenous microorganisms. Mm -hmm. For listeners wanting homemade fertilizer, this is key. Right. And the analogy used was making the dough, wasn't it? Yeah. Instead of buying, say, baker's yeast from the store, a known quantity, you're trying to capture the wild local yeasts and bacteria that are just out there in your environment. Using what you've got. And speaking of capturing them, we can't forget Kesser losing his sock full of rice to a mole. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A good reminder that fieldwork has its uh, unique challenges. Nature doesn't always read the manual. So true. Anyway, after you've put out your collection medium, like rice, there's the incubator phase. Which is just letting the microbes you caught multiply, right? Like that yeast example, one cell becomes two, then four, doubling every 20 minutes or so under good conditions. Exactly. They can reproduce incredibly fast, which brings up the difference between aerobic and anaerobic conditions. Ah, uh, yes. Oxygen or no oxygen. Mm. This seems pretty important for IMO, but sometimes the explanations are a bit simplified. They can be. 
Basically, aerobic means with oxygen, anaerobic means without, and different microbes prefer different conditions. Like yeast making alcohol. That's without yeah. oxygen, right? Right. Yeast ferments sugar to alcohol and CO2 anaerobically. And then you have lactic acid bacteria, often a big part of beneficial IMO, which produce lactic acid, also typically in anaerobic or low oxygen conditions. So the conditions you create really matter for which microbes take over. Definitely. And as we heard, you can find starter microbes almost anywhere. The forest floor is classic, but even like the back of the fridge could have interesting stuff. Wow. Okay. Nature's pantry. Now, Kesser and Steen brought up adding things like table salt sometimes. Why was that? It seemed less about a fixed recipe and more about um, experimenting seeing how adding different things might select for certain microbes or change the outcome, studying the process, as Mr. Hendricks put it. Right, observing the effects, which ties into the different ways people approach this whole thing and uh, Steen's concrete mixer idea. Ah, uh, yeah, that was ambitious. Shows the range, though, from small home batches to potentially larger scales. But regardless of scale, a really critical point came up about the source of your materials, mm. especially for compost or manure. Oh, absolutely crucial. The warnings about chemical residues from commercial farming, very real. Finding clean organic sources is pretty important if you can. Yeah, you don't want to accidentally introduce herbicides or pesticides. And there were those specific warnings, too, like avoiding manure from horses treated with certain dewormers because those chemicals can persist. And the risk of unwanted seeds, like invasive rose seeds coming in with manure, practical stuff. Definitely things to watch out for. And it's good to remember, with IMO, the main goal isn't usually hitting specific NPK fertilizer numbers. Right. It's more about cultivating a diverse bunch of beneficial microorganisms. Exactly. It's the life you're adding to the soil. That's the primary benefit. And the source matters there too, right? Like horse manure versus cow manure having different microbes because of their digestive systems. Yep. Different animals, different gut microbiomes, different outputs. Kesser exploring seaweed and cow dung is a perfect example of trying different potential microbial sources. It really emphasizes the exploration part of it. Mm -hmm. And that anecdote Mr. Hendricks told about his chemistry class the wooden paddle. Oh yeah, the paddle apparently having some residue that acted as an unexpected catalyst, creating color pigments. Right. It's a great analogy for how sometimes tiny overlooked things, maybe trace elements, maybe specific microbes, can have a surprisingly big impact in these biological processes, an unknown inoculant. It's a good reminder that we don't always know every variable at play, which is why this isn't about us giving you a step-by-step -step foolproof recipe today. No, definitely not. It's more about sharing the background, the concepts, the observations, so you feel equipped to you know, explore it yourself, understand the why behind it. So let's quickly recap. We've seen this amazing springtime link between tree roots and soil fungi, this nutrient cycling partnership. We've looked at IMO collection as a resourceful way to harness local microbes for your soil, kind of like making sourdough starter. And we've touched on why thinking about your sources is important and how different people might approach these processes from socks full of rice to well, concrete mixers. And hopefully understanding these underlying biological gears turning gives you a richer perspective on your garden and how soil health really works. It's not just dirt. Absolutely. So maybe a final thought for you to ponder. Knowing about that spring collaboration between trees and fungi, how might that influence when or where you choose to collect soil microbes for your own garden experiments? Yeah, and what other hidden partnerships, these unseen collaborations are going right. on down there that we're only just starting to appreciate? Lots to think about. Ever stop to think about what's happening like right into your feet in the garden? There's this whole hidden world. Oh, absolutely. It's buzzing with activity and it's uh, way more connected to how our plants grow than most people realize. Exactly. And that's what we want to dig into today, especially if you're looking to, you know, boost your garden naturally, maybe even make your own fertilizer. Right.